operator commutes with something that is an irreducible algebra. And so by Schur's lemma, it has to be uh, uh, a proportional to the identity. So that's basically the argument. What, what, how does that argument rule out just something like uh, um, complex conjugation times uh, I mean, that, that doesn't give that. I mean, it's an anti unitary operation, but. So, so, okay, let me, okay, good. So, so it's uh, e to the i. Uh, sigma x plus sigma y or something like that, maybe over two. It's some, uh, it's some rotation about some axis in Pali space, yeah. right? Uh, and uh, so, uh, so if this is uh, u, t, so you say, I guess this is not one, plus or minus one. This has imaginary, well, yeah, so, so if I write it this way, then this has imaginary entries and this is real, that's what you mean? So, and why, why would I uh, get this? I don't know what it means physically, but right. I, I just... In terms of the math mathematics, it, I don't see how it's excluded. Well, uh, so I guess there there's an argument uh, that that leads to this statement. We can discuss the the meaning of the argument, uh, but at this point, I I I don't see yet a connection with this of this matrix. Uh, with anything uh, having to do with time reverse. It's 11 o'clock in the next lecture. Oh, okay. Start. Okay. Uh. So we have to... We, we <laughs> oh, let's see, how do we do this? Can I uh, fix them maybe first? Okay, and I give sure. them to you tomorrow? Sure, sure. Okay. okay, thank you. I have to, I want to maybe put some uh, uh, reference or something. I want to okay. take off the mic. Recorded everything.
so it's my pleasure to introduce Ashwin Vishwanath, who is already lecturing. You've already missed the first 30 seconds. You gotta go. But he's visiting us previously from Berkeley now from, from Harvard, who will be telling us about files in the middles and SPT. Maybe so I'll get out of the way. Okay, so yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> So I'll be, I, um, uh, so th the plan of this talk will be uh, mainly based on this uh, review that uh, I wrote with um, uh, Ari Turner, who I was very happy to see is here. Uh, so if you have any really hard questions, you should direct it to him. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so, um, so the, the idea of this uh, set of topics um, is um, you know you've heard a lot about um, uh, topological band insulators. Um, for example, in um, the previous lecture uh, and in Charlie Kane's lecture, you heard about um, uh, or you will hear about how to classify uh, the topological properties of free fermions. Um, and um, the states that you will be uh, looking at are ones that have a, a gap in the bulk. Okay, so there are two. Uh, simplifying uh, features, um, an energy gap, <clears throat> so that was uh, in some of the other previous talks and uh, Andreas's talk. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to try relaxing um, some of these assumptions. Um, and uh, we won't be so brave as to relax them both at the same time. Uh, we'll do that one at a time. Uh, so the first thing that we'll do is continue working with uh, essentially free particles, free fermions, uh, but we'll close the energy gap, okay? And we'll ask, um, uh, are, uh, is there some sense in which uh, the topological properties still survive? Um, and um, the answer, of course, is, um, is yes. Okay, but uh, we'll have to introduce, uh, you know, one assumption. Uh, we'll need one crutch uh, to be able to survive the closing of the gap, which is we're going to uh, assume uh, translation symmetry. Okay, so in some sense, this part will be um, sort of the opposite of what Andreas is going to do. Uh, so Andreas is going to talk about uh, having an energy, energy gap and talk about phases where there is disorder and there is no translation symmetry. Okay, and uh, that classification uh, benefits uh, from not having translation symmetry, so you can really uh, you know, study the uh, uh, certain general classes. Okay, on the other hand, we are going to uh, close the energy gap uh, but we're going to retain uh, translation symmetry. So we're thinking about uh, a perfect crystal, if you like. Um, and the fact that we have translation symmetry will uh, allow us to make progress and allow us to um, you know, survive, if you like, the closing of this energy gap. Okay, so the, the main part, uh, the main thing that I'll talk about is the simplest example of this physics. Um, Okay, the wild semi-metals. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so that's part one. So that I'm, I'm thinking will be a couple of lectures. Um, and the remaining two lectures, um, we're gonna do, look at interacting particles, maybe fermions or bosons, um, but we'll retain the energy gap. Okay, so we'll talk about analogs of topological insulators and so on, uh, but where the interactions are present and uh, in many cases, the interactions are gonna be extremely strong. Um, and there is no sort of free particle description uh, that's around nearby to help you. Okay, so that'll be sort of a complementary uh, discussion. Um, and uh, <clears throat> okay, so let's see if I can uh, sort of keep to this uh, schedule. Okay, so, um, so the plan for today uh, is to talk about wild semi-metals. Uh, and I'll start with giving you some background. Okay, so I'll talk about a few things that you probably all know, but um, uh, we'll, we'll sort of kind of see how these things come together. 
uh, and will help us to talk about um, wild semi-metals. Um, And um, you know there'll be some special surface states associated with these uh, systems, very much like um, you know churn insulators and topological insulators. Um, so I'll also want to talk about that today. Um, and then perhaps tomorrow we'll see the effect of a magnetic field. Okay, and um, uh, what I want to do tomorrow is to um, you know rather than um, you know cover uh, the background, which hopefully would have been covered by then, uh, I want to present sort of a case study. Okay, um, so we'll uh, see how we can make certain experimental predictions. Okay, um, and um, there are some experiments um, already that uh, claim to uh, see this, uh, these predictions. So we'll, uh, you know, try to see how those things come together. Uh, and the idea being that uh, you know whether you utilize these the details of this uh, theory or not, uh, it may be useful for someone who's a student, uh, someone starting out, uh, to see how a, a field progresses. Um, how at some point you, you start with an idea. Uh, in fact, some of the ideas that went in here were quite abstract, and um, you know at that time we had no idea this would actually make contact with experiments. But uh, today there are materials and there are experiments. Um, and you can see how um, you know, these things can evolve to a point where you can compare with experiments. And as usual, um, <clears throat> you know, as in any real experiment, uh, the comparison is not going to be perfect. There are going to be question marks that, um, you know, that uh, uh, are there in the beginning, which maybe stay for a long time. Um, so all of that is, is there in this case study. So we'll uh, talk about wild fermions in a magnetic field. Um, and utilize what we learned today and um, the first half of the, uh, the lectures tomorrow. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so I actually have some lecture notes. Um, okay, so uh, hopefully you'll be able to read these lecture notes. Um, so my plan is to actually keep things very simple uh, in the discussion, um, and all of the details and the uh, equations and uh, the correct signs and factors of 2 pi uh, are in the lecture notes. Uh, I think they're correct, but if you find mistakes, please let me know. Um, but that's my excuse for kind of being a little bit sloppy on the board. Um, uh, so you should look up these notes if you want uh, all the details. Um, and there are also some uh, exercises in the notes, uh, which maybe we can discuss tomorrow morning. Uh, yeah, so please take a look at them. They are. Um, Yes, some of them are completely uh, like fill in the blanks kind of exercises, uh, but some of them are a little more interesting. Uh, so one of the questions, for example, I have at the end is, uh, you know, we're going to come up with the theory of topological semi-metals. Okay, so if I give you a semi-metal, you should be able to tell me is it topological or not, and if it is topological, in what sense? Okay, can you make a precise uh, definition of this? And we'll give such a definition for these wild semi-metals. Uh, but there are many other examples. For example, the most well-known semi-metal is graphene. Okay, um, and you can ask: Is it, in some sense, a topological semi-metal? Okay, so that's something to think about, um, and uh, we'll discuss that in the morning tomorrow. But it essentially involves taking the ideas that we develop here in one context and applying it in a different one, which is not exactly the same. Uh, but uh, you know, you you can make progress. Um, uh, using these general concepts. <laughs> wow, okay. That <laughs> so for gap full systems, there is the, the connection that the uh, you know, topological state is a gap full state. When your system was gapless, is there some sort of like all encompassing definition of what it means for it to be topological, or we still need to go on a case by case basis? So for free fermions, there is something we can say. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's better to say it with an example. Uh, so, for example, you can ask wild semi-metals, what's topological about it? Okay, so you have a three-dimensional system. Um, so you have a three-dimensional Brillouin zone. Let me assume it's non-interacting for a moment. 
Although I actually believe some of this can be extended to the case of interacting systems when you preserve translation symmetry, but that's a more involved question. Let's do non-interacting, okay? Um, so you have some points in the Brillouin zone where the, um, uh, the bands meet. Um, <clears throat> okay, and, um, but if you look, over, if you take sections of the Brillouin zone, don't take the whole three-dimensional Brillouin zone at one go, but take, take say, let's say, two-dimensional sections. Take planes, for example. Um, if you look at these planes, if they do not intersect these points, uh, then they look like a gapped system. They look like a gapped uh, band structure, except that they live in two dimensions. Okay. And you can classify the topological properties of these two-dimensional band structures. Okay. And um, these topological semi-metals occur when uh, the topological index characterizing these lower dimensional systems is not uniform through your three-dimensional system. Okay, so in this particular case, it'll be churn number. You'll have a plane where the churn number is unity and another one where the churn number is zero. It'll change as you go through the Brillouin zone. And there's no way for this change to occur while preserving the gap. Okay, this is essentially a phase transition of this two-dimensional system. So you're forced to have a band touching somewhere. Uh, and in that sense, this band touching is topologically protected. Uh, it's not just a local phenomenon. It occurs because there is this global change. Okay, so uh, what we'll see is, um, uh, with some caveats, uh, the classification of a d-dimensional semi-metal is related to the classification of gapped band structures in the lower dimensions. Okay, and um, exactly how this occurs is very simple for the wild semi-metal, but this ex other example I gave, graphene, it turns out it's, it's not that obvious. Yeah, so I didn't necessarily say D minus one, it's just the lower D. Oh, so you, you can go, you know, whatever four dimensions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can even go to negative dimensions, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, and um, yeah, so it turns out that the table that Andreas is gonna show uh, in a few uh, lectures uh, with all of these different symmetry classes and the topological phases, for example, I can write a, a little bit of that table. Okay, so we have a dimension and we have the symmetric classes. Um, so let me just write a fragment of it because uh, this is the one that's gonna be relevant. Also, this is the only part I remember. So, um, okay, so we have one dimension, okay, and so on. Um, and the classification uh, uh, in this particular case is very simple for this pair of symmetric classes, uh, they just alternate. Actually, strictly speaking, I should also do seven and eight for completeness. <laughs> Here it's just a periodicity mod two, but the rest of them have periodicity mod eight. Um, so we're interested in three dimensions, of course, uh, wild semi-metals, and we're gonna be interested in this particular class. Um, uh, let's say the, the one without time reversal symmetry, uh, there is no topological invariant, uh, but there is um, <clears throat> a topological invariant in the lower dimension. Again, this is simply the churn number Yeah, and that's gonna come up in this classification of the three-dimensional uh, wild semi metals. Okay, so, so there is a precise definition, at least for free fermions. Okay, so that was just to answer Victor's question. Now, let me... Um, Okay, so by the way, feel free to ask uh, uh, questions. Um, I feel that since I've written some lecture notes, I don't have to get through all the uh, material. So, uh, you know, it's more, you know, I can answer the questions the way a lecture note cannot, right? So utilize me for the questions and the lecture notes for the details, perhaps. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> okay, in terms of background, um, Okay, so three different things I want to talk about. One is about accidental degeneracies. Okay, 
Okay, so there's something very simple that you've all learned in quantum mechanics, uh, at least if you learned it from uh, Landau and Lifshitz, um, but I'll review that. Um, the second thing we'll talk about is uh, the Dirac and Weyl equations. Okay, and the third one, you've already heard about this in um, Charlie Kane's talk, is um, uh, the, the band invariants are um, Okay, in particular, I'm going to be interested in churn number. Okay, let me just, do, I will define that, and then we're going to utilize all three of these uh, ideas when we talk about uh, uh, wild semi-metals. Okay. Okay, so first let me uh, review this uh, accidental degeneracies. Um, so this is really simple. In fact, it was discovered, I think, just a few years after quantum mechanics itself. Um, so the question is the following. I give you a quantum mechanics problem. Okay, and there are no symmetries, uh, just to be simple. Okay, I have some uh, Hamiltonian um, with some uh, function of some parameters. Uh, I get some spectrum. Okay. The question is, as I vary these parameters, uh, how do these uh, energy levels move around? Uh, in particular, can I get a pair of energy levels uh, to do the following, okay, to, uh, to cross uh, and actually become degenerate at some point? Okay, so that's an accidental degeneracy. Uh, it's, it's obtained by tuning this parameter lambda to some particular value. Uh, and the question is, can I do this? Um, you know, just we can focus on a pair of energy levels for this uh, um, <clears throat> uh, for this question. The question is, you know, how many parameters do I need to tune to to have this happen? Okay, does someone know the answer? Three. three. Yeah. So you need you need to tune three parameters. Okay, so that's um, <clears throat> the first time you hear it, a little surprising. You'd think you could just tune one parameter, right? just get these two numbers to cross. Okay, but the idea here is that you're considering a gen generic Hamiltonian. Uh, and as you tune these parameters, um, the Hamiltonian is allowed to vary uh, in the most general way. Okay, so if you have a two by two Hamilton, if you just focus on these two levels, uh, you can effectively write down a two by two Hamiltonian um, that um, sort of controls how these levels are, are changing. Let's say they get pretty close, so you can zoom in on them. Uh, and any two by two matrix you can expand, uh, uh, something proportional to the identity. Uh, and then there is, um, um, <clears throat> okay, something proportional to the Pauli matrices. Let me call this F0. Okay, so this really is not um, controlling the splitting. That's just an overall energy shift. Uh, I can ignore it. Okay, so these are really the ones that control the energy shift. Okay, and the, the naive picture is that, you know, you're just getting this to cross with one parameter, uh, as though you only have this one function changing. Okay, the coefficient of sigma z that tells you the energy splitting. Okay, but in general, the matrix elements between these levels can also change as you vary this parameter, uh, and that'll lead to level repulsion. Uh, and to overcome that level repulsion, you need to tune more parameters. Okay, so in fact, to get this degeneracy, uh, if you look at the energy splitting for this pair of levels, um, so you need each and every one of these three Fs to be zero in order to obtain the energy splitting. Okay, so you have to solve three equations. Again, okay, typically if you had three parameters, uh, you have a chance of solving these three equations. Okay, you're not guaranteed that you'll have a solution, but you have as many parameters as equations, so um, you, know, you have a fighting chance of getting a solution. Okay, so typically you need um, Yeah. So does this argument rely on the fact that there are two 
basis factors are independent of one? No, it's completely general. So then what is your basis? Uh, you just project your Hamiltonian into the spare. No, but you have to, the, the basis factors are general. They will. In fact, the, the eigenvectors of this Hamiltonian depend on lambda. Um, I mean, of course, you have a much bigger matrix. Um, okay, but effectively, the thing that's going to uh, matter uh, is the block that's controlling the splitting. Um, so, if you like, you can imagine these are closed. Okay, so. Okay, so you know the, the real worry is that um, I guess what you're worried about is what about these other levels? Uh, don't they mix in? Uh, but imagine that I get these things to be very close to one another. Okay, I start at this limit, um, and now can you uh, enforce this degeneracy uh, where the uh, <coughs> you know the matrix elements to these uh, other levels they may be present, uh, but their denominators are going to be large. So you're kind of zoomed into the limit where um, you almost have a degeneracy, uh, and you're trying to force the, you know, trying to get it to be exactly degenerate. And at this stage itself, you need three parameters. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, you. You can try to make the argument for the most general system, where you have many uh, energy eigenvalues. Uh, but eventually, you have to pick a pair that you want them, which you want to be degenerate, right? So the um, problem is phrased in terms of a pair of levels uh, that become degenerate. If I just give you this entire spectrum, what's the question you're asking? They probably do, but that change is going to be negligible compared to the mixing between these two levels. Uh, no, so it, you know you are focusing on a pair of levels. You're kind of doing this projection into a pair of levels. But it's different projection at every lambda. Yeah, but you know this is just mixing this pair. I think that's what he's saying, right? This basis is just this um, the eigenvectors of um, let's just take the eigenvectors of sigma z. Uh, of course, you could say that they are changing with as a function of lambda. Uh, maybe that's what you're saying. So at every point, you can. Um, Actually, maybe that's a good way of doing it. So as a function of lambda, yeah, so the definition of your basis can change, if you like. Um, and which basis you're referring to, so let me say my uh, two states, which is Yeah, so this can change, and then you can write on an effective Hamiltonian for these. That makes sense. That's sort of, um, um, you know, that's in the lowest order approximation, right? If you go to higher order in k dot p, you will have to mix in these other levels. So I think you're doing zeroth order perturbation theory. That's when the basis vectors don't change. Yeah. Yes. So I can make you know, I can make projections out of the eigenstates of this H one two. They can So symmetry is independent of Hamiltonian. If you have an operator that commutes to the Hamiltonian that keeps changing for every value of the parameters, that's not a symmetry. Right. So you say that I have a symmetry of my Hamiltonian and I'm allowed to uh, vary parameters that where it stays symmetric. Right? Otherwise you're just taking the Hamiltonian itself or some projection of the Hamiltonian and calling that a symmetry. So that's not a valid symmetry. Symmetry should be just in, uh, independent of, uh, of parameters. The other thing is that symmetry is typically local. You know, you, yeah. You Then the higher 
Yes, effect. yeah, that's right. The question is whether or not the, if such a small effect, albeit small, whether it only just moves the stability point around or it can go to a very small gap. No, so the way to do it is to take that into account in the definition of these states. Uh, and then, so you're projected into this pair of levels. And now the, the final piece that you need to do is to see how these levels uh, actually interact with one another, which is the dominant interaction, right? Because they're very close. Um, so in some sense, you can summarize all of the other effects. Uh, you know, look at the, the perturbation from all of the levels far away. And, um, you know, solve that problem first and you get these two levels. And they can shift your energy levels around and that's the, the starting point and then you look at what happens when you mix these two levels. Okay, so um, so that so that was the first um, point, and in the exercises you can you know try to do this when you have symmetries. So one simple symmetry is if you had time reversal, uh, you would not be allowed to have the sigma y, uh, and then you can close this energy gap uh, with just two parameters. Okay, and um, in fact the, this dimensionality that comes out three and two uh, is related to the fact that you have wild semi-metals in three dimensions uh, and something like graphene in two dimensions. Say it again? Uh, that, yes, that's right, yeah. Or, you know, you can have a combination of time reversal and some other symmetry like inversion. Okay, so, um, so the next um, thing I want to talk about is uh, the Dirac equation. So this is sort of taking a step into um, relativistic physics. Um, and again, this is something that should be quite uh, familiar to most of you. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, so the way in which we usually um, write this equation, which is how I guess Dirac wrote it, uh, is you have these four by four matrices, uh, alpha and beta. So, um, in the square to unity, um, okay, and from this you can derive a simpler equation, which is what uh, Weil did. Okay, in certain conditions, um, <coughs> Okay, um, so of course, if you recall the way in which um, you know, Dirac came up with this equation, the, the requirement for these anti-commuting matrices is you, want an, uh, you essentially want a particle that's uh, described by um, you know, Lorentz invariant energy momentum relation. Um, and if you substitute uh, energy for time and uh, P for these spatial derivatives, um, the fact that they anti-commute gives you this uh, energy dispersion. Right. Okay, now um, the Weyl equation is something a simpler form that you can derive in, in, when you have um, <coughs> uh, a massless form. Yeah. Okay, and that turns out to be very important. Um, okay, so that's one requirement. The other requirement is that you are in an odd spatial dimension, like three. Uh, <clears throat> so, of course, both of them are satisfied over here. Um, so, there's one uh, way of writing these Dirac matrices where this is very obvious. Um, so, let's say this beta is, um, uh, so I'm going to write down these four by four matrices as tensors uh, of a pair of poly matrices. So, uh, if I take the identity in the first part and tensor it with tau x, okay, so that's my beta matrix, it squares to one, uh, and my alpha matrices, these are, these are vectors, so I need a vector of them. I use the Pauli vector, uh, but now I need, needed to anti-commute with this first one. Let's use tau z. 
Okay, so if I take this set of uh, matrices, um, <coughs> uh, and now let me say I set the mass to zero, so all I have are these uh, alpha matrices, uh, and I notice that um, you know this tau z is just uh, coming for the right. Okay, in other words, if I take the matrix tau z, okay, which is um, you know the identity times tau z. Okay, which is really the product of these three alphas uh, up to some um, factor of i. Let me print just a, a factor of i over there. Um, so this matrix tau z uh, commutes with all the matrices in my Hamiltonian uh, because I set the mass to zero. Okay, so in which case you can diagonalize this matrix, uh, assign eigenvalues plus and minus one um, to these uh, So let me actually just write it here. Okay, and then I can write on a simpler equation for that in, in the, uh, compared to the Dirac equation, which utilized uh, four by four uh, matrices. Um, so I can write on an equation. Uh, A Hamiltonian, if you like, that is um, okay, which looks like that, right? Okay, so now I've got a representation in terms of two by two matrices. <clears throat> so I've got a simpler representation of the alpha matrices. But I need to specify whether this tau z is plus or minus one, uh, and I get two kinds of uh, wild fermions. Um, okay, and this is just the chirality of the wild fermions. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. Um, Okay, but you can kind of see why this only works in odd spatial dimensions. Um, you take this product of the, of the alpha matrices, uh, and you want them to commute with the alphas themselves. Okay, so of course, one of the alpha matrices is gonna be common between the two when you attempt a commutation, and then there'll be an even number that's left uh, that's different. Okay, an even number of matrices that anti-commute with your uh, alpha matrix, uh, which means that this entire product will commute. So in any odd dimension, um, so where did the odd dimensionality come in? Okay, this ensures that this product uh, uh, just commutes. Okay, and you can label your states uh, with this product, which is just the chirality. Okay, now if you were in an even dimension, you could again take this product uh, but it's not going to give you this uh, property. Okay, so in three dimensions, you have chiral fermions, um, and in, in one dimension, you have chiral fermions too. So in one dimension, there's a, we only have one alpha. You can take that to be one of the Pauli matrices, uh, and then depending on the um, eigenvalue of that Pauli matrix, you get either a right or left moving uh, chiral fermion. Okay, so. Uh, <coughs> And in D equal to one, okay, so I've been, I've dropped all the velocities uh, over here. Um, <coughs> this yeah, that's right, this is gamma five. Yeah. 
Yeah, so there's a gamma 5 in every odd dimension. That may be a little bit bad notation. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so those are the first two things that I want to talk about. Um, I didn't get into a discussion of Majorana fermions. You can um, you know, include that complexity as well, um, which is asking whether you can write this Dirac equation uh, where all the matrices are real. Okay, and then you can ask whether that's compatible with having wild fermions. Okay, and it turns out that in three dimensions, the two are not compatible, uh, which is sort of obvious because once you go to this wild basis, one of these Pauli matrices is complex. Okay, but in one dimension, you don't have a matrix. Okay? So you, it's compatible to have both the while and the Majorana condition applied at the same time. In fact, we know that the edge of a P plus IP superconductor is something that propagates only in one direction, just like this, but is also a Majorana fermion. Okay, so when you have a dimension one mod eight, again, this mod eight is going to pop up, uh, then you can have both at the same time. Uh, but for example, in our three-dimensional world, uh, uh, we have to make a choice. Okay, and once you have a wild fermion, you cannot write down the equations using real matrices. Okay, that's just a side comment that I'm not going to utilize for the rest of the talk, so uh, let me not dwell on that. Okay, so the third thing we want to talk about, um, which is sort of going to uh, uh, be more relevant to band theory, um, is um, the churn number. And first, let's define the Berry curvature. Okay, so in doing this, I want to define a gapped system. So, um, okay, so I have some band, uh, some uh, a pair of bands. I'm going to call this the valence band. Okay, and I'm just going to focus on this one band. Um, throughout the Brillouin zone, uh, there is some uh, wave function, um, some state okay, associated with these bands. Um, and I'm only going to consider this valence band. And we know that we can build uh, a, a Berry connection out of this. Um, okay, there's some subscript over here, which is the overlap of um, this band. Um, Maybe there's some factor of i. You take a derivative as you move around this Brillouin uh, zone. And of course, that we know that you take this integral around a closed loop that's related to the Berry's phase acquired by these uh, wave functions. Uh, and there's a curvature that you can build out of, out of this. It's just the usual derivative of. Okay, and uh, in a two-dimensional system, okay, we know that the integral of this <coughs> Berry curvature, now in 2D, the two indices had better be x and y. Okay, so let me just call it f. Okay, if you integrate it over the Brillouin zone in a gapped system, this has to be a multiple of, be normalized by 2 pi, this has to be an integer. Let me call it C, actually. <clears throat> okay, so we're used to doing this in, uh, for just a two-dimensional Brillouin zone, periodic boundary conditions. Um, Okay, but in principle, you could do this for any closed uh, manifold. And um, you know, if you have a three-dimensional band structure, you can pick a closed surface that defines a two-dimensional surface. And you can integrate the, uh, the Berry flux piercing that surface and come up with some quantity. And you're guaranteed that that's going to be an integer as well. Okay, so there's a more general um, definition to this, just like magnetic field piercing a surface. And this just happens to be the analog of magnetic field piercing the surface of a torus. 
Okay, so we know that we know the physical interpretation of this. If I give you a band structure, uh, which had um, uh, you know some churn number, uh, it has a physical um, consequence, which is it has Hall conductance, which is uh, the same equal to C times uh, fundamental constants, uh, and it has these edge states that propagate when you uh, make a when you divide the system and you have an edge, uh, they propagate in in just one direction. Okay, so those are the physical uh, consequences of having churn number. Let me just put it up there. Um, <clears throat> okay, that's one consequence. And the other is that if you look at the edge, uh, so let's say I make an edge that's along the x direction. Okay, and there is a coordinate y um, that goes into the sample. Okay, if I plot the energy bands, of course they're gapped. Okay, this is a function of kx. Okay, but then I have uh, these chiral edge states. Uh, I've just drawn one over here. Um, so this is c equal to one. Okay, which are exposed when you get to the edge of a sample. Okay, and these are nothing but these 1D chiral fermions. Okay, if you just zoom in on the low energy dispersion over here, the energy is proportional to the momentum with some velocity, um, essentially corresponds to the one with the plus sign. The one going the other way, which is on the opposite side of the sample, uh, is the one corresponding to the minus sign. Oh, why is that uh, integers? <clears throat> okay, so you know, if you simply look at um, you know this expression over here, um, your f is the curl of a. Okay, so what you're doing is you're integrating curl of some script a um, over some surface, uh, and this is a closed surface. Okay, so this formula, you know, uh, seems to say this is zero, right? Okay, so integral of uh, the curl of some quantity is simply the line integral of that quantity on the boundary. There's no boundary, so it's got to be zero. Okay, but we know there are other instances like this where naively something looks like it's zero, but actually it's quantized. Um, and the way to see this is, um, is to realize that this equality holds if this a is a function. Okay, in other words, if I tell you the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the crystal momenta, the kx, ky, uh, if this a had a unique value, uh, then this, you would be justified in saying this. Uh, this is the usual manipulation that we do for functions. Okay, but in fact, a is, um, you know, uh, uh, this quantity, is, it's not a physical quantity. Uh, in fact, it's not even gauge invariant. So if, for example, I picked one of these momenta and I made some phase change, um, okay, that's a perfectly good definition of my uh, block states. Okay, now, uh, you know, we know from quantum mechanics nothing physical is going to change, but if you look at this expression over here, you're going to acquire a new phase dependence over here. You hit that with a derivative. If this depends on the momentum k, which you're, you're certainly allowed to do, uh, this a is going to change. Okay, and it's going to change by the gradient of a function. Okay, so basically, this uh, what you can think is that uh, this uh, on, on some closed surface, uh, you have this definition of a. Okay, but um, uh, you know you should not be so um, uh, rigid as to demand one single definition of a over the entire surface. Okay, you can have different uh, regions. Let's say this is region one and region two, where you have uh, definitions of A. Okay, but where they overlap, uh, there should be some consistency condition. Okay, you can imagine that these come from different phase choices. Uh, so where they overlap, they can only differ by the gradient of some function. Okay, so, um, so let's use this more, de more general definition of A. It's not a single function over the entire Brillouin zone. Um, it's a function that can have patches 
uh, and the patches uh, overlap. So you really have a definition of this object over the entire uh, Brillwa zone. But um, uh, you know, they're allowed to differ, but only in a physically consistent way. Okay, so A1 minus A2, where they are both defined, uh, is simply the gradient of this phase. Okay, so they, are they just differ by a gauge transformation. You're allowed to do that. There's nothing physically different between these two. Okay, so then what you can do is you can um, use your, your usual formula for the two pieces, A1 and A2. Uh, they both get represented by uh, some line integrals on these loops, uh, and normally they would cancel. Okay, normally you would get integral of A1 minus A2. Okay, and if these were the same function, they would just cancel. But now we say that they can differ by the gradient of a phase. Okay, so this is the line integral of the gradient of a phase. Okay, so now again, this formula looks like something that should be zero. Okay, line integral of the gradient of some function around a closed path uh, should just be zero. Uh, but again, we, uh, we realize that this is a phase. There's no reason a phase should come back to itself when it comes back to the same point, because the phase itself is not measurable. The only thing that you can measure is the exponential of a phase. Okay, so it's really that e to the i phi at two points that are supposed to be identical Uh, should be equal, right? So they can actually differ by any integer. Okay, so I'm talking about 2 pi as what happens when you go around this thing. It can be any 2 pi times some integer. Actually, let me call this integer c, just to get back to the old. Okay, so if you plug that in over there, what you find is that this integral of, um, so the, the original thing that we wanted to do, we wanted to calculate this f of k d2k. There was some massaging. Uh, we ended up with uh, this line integral. Okay, and this we said is 2 pi times some integer. Okay, so that's really the quantization of this. Uh, so I divide by 2 pi over here to get an integer. Okay, so this is the same argument as what Dirac gave for uh, magnetic monopoles. So if you think about this as magnetic flux through a, curved, uh, through a closed surface, uh, the statement that it's zero is the same as saying that there are no monopoles. If you had magnetic monopoles, they could fall inside your surface, uh, and then there would be a net flux. Okay, but this net flux cannot be anything. Um, it's constrained to be uh, quantized if you have quantized charges. Uh, and the way in which Dirac argued is, he said, of course, uh, you know, in, in, if you insist on a regular vector potential, uh, of course, this thing is zero. But part of the flux may be living in a, in a string where uh, it's a solenoid of exactly 2 pi flux. Okay, and if you had a solenoid of exactly 2 pi flux, you'd never know that. Uh, your electron would not get any Arnaud Bohm phase going around that. So you can, you can just ignore those things. And what remains is a flux that compensates, which is basically multiples of 2 pi. Okay, but it's important in that argument that there is a basic unit charge that does not see this 2 pi flux. If you're allowed to get uh, arbitrary charges, smaller and smaller charges, you could see smaller and smaller flux. You could be very sensitive to the flux, uh, and this argument would not work. Okay, so magnetic monopoles are allowed and quantized uh, when the charge is quantized. Perhaps. <laughs> I don't think of it like that, but um, presumably, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so those are the three things that. Um, Uh, that's the background that we needed. Um, so now let's apply this to um, the problem we're interested in, uh, which is these wild semi metals. Okay.
Okay, so uh, <coughs> uh, so what we're going to do here, of course, is we have a band structure um, in three dimensions. Can we label the um, uh, you know this block Hamiltonian um, by the, the three momenta? Um, and what we argued before um, is that when you have three parameters, general quantum mechanical problem, you can get accidental degeneracies. Okay. Um, so part of the, uh, an important ingredient in this argument is that you have non-degenerate bands. Okay, so, um, so one of the exercises I had in the, uh, that I have is, uh, you know, what happens to this uh, argument that we had here, uh, but we have Kramer's pairs, not just non-degenerate bands, but uh, pairs of levels that stick together because of a symmetry, um, and uh, you know, are you able to do the same thing? And that's a different problem. Okay, so uh, so if if you want to get non-degenerate bands, um, degeneracy is really imposed by time reversal symmetry. So uh, we we heard about squaring of time reversal, uh, which can either be plus or minus one. And for electrons, of course, we know this is minus one. Uh, that gives rise to Kramer's degeneracies. Uh, but if I uh, talk about the, the block Hamiltonian, uh, this is at a particular momentum. Okay, so if I apply time reversal symmetry to it, it relates this Hamiltonian to the one with uh, the negative uh, momentum. Um, so it, it does not in itself tell you something about degeneracies of this particular one body Hamiltonian. Okay, so in order to talk about the degeneracy of this one, you need to uh, come back to plus k, uh, and you could do that if you had inversion symmetry. Okay, so inversion reverses all of the coordinates. Okay, so if you had a combination of time reversal and uh, inversion symmetry, um, okay, you can check that this is also minus one when acting on electrons, um, at least in three dimensions. Um, and uh, that would also give you the same Kramer's type of theorem, but now applied to a single momentum point. Okay, and this is really what we do not want. Okay? We want to be in the situation where you do not have degeneracies. So we have to break either the time reversal, uh, time reversal or the inversion symmetry. Okay, and of course, you can also break both. That's uh, just as good. Yeah, you're right, yeah. So I've been a little sloppy over here, so there is some, um, some matrix. Um, I don't know what, I think Andreas called that, was it you? Uh, some stars and so on, yeah. So there is some time reversal operation, but it it's refers to the, the point minus k. And here too, you can have some matrix that implements inversion. We call it ui. So I'm not being very careful over here. It's just to make the point that um, you need to be at the same k point in order to talk about the genesis of that block Hamilton. Okay, so we're going to consider systems which break uh, one of the, at least one of these symmetries, uh, and we have then we have these non-degenerate bands. Okay, so by the counting argument that we had before, uh, as I vary three parameters, uh, I have a chance of finding a degeneracy. Okay, so it can happen that two energy levels as a function of k. Okay, so this is supposed to collectively denote all the three k's. At some point uh, in this Brillouin zone, uh, you can get a, uh, a degeneracy. Okay, and let's analyze what happens uh, when you're close to that point.
um, we have translation symmetry, you mean? Right. Yes, that's right. The one being? Uh, oh, you can choose to break both. And even if you choose to break just one, uh, that particular symmetry does not fix you at the k0 point. Um, so viewed as a symmetry of my block Hamiltonian, uh, it's not really a symmetry. It relates my block Hamiltonian at k to one at minus k. So it doesn't constrain the spectrum. It just tells you the spectrum you get over here is the same as the one you're going to get in that other problem. Um, so from that counting point of view, there's no symmetry over here. Once I fix the k, uh, and I'm just looking at this crossing. Yeah, so the uh, analysis is identical for all the three possible cases you could think of, break T, break I, or break, the com you know, break both together uh, at this level of, of um, discussion. Actually, how much time do I have, Leo? I kind of lost another half an hour. Okay, good. Okay, so um, so we want to uh, look away from this uh, this point, um, and uh, <clears throat> okay. So let me say that um, I, I choose my uh, my zero of energy, uh, so that this is just zero. Okay, so both of bo the energy levels are degenerate, and they have energy uh, eigenvalue of zero. Okay, and we want to know what happens as you move away. Um, so like we said before, it's sufficient if you're very close to this point. Um, you, know, you can simply expand uh, the Hamiltonian uh, in terms of these two by two matrices. So there's some F naught, um, so the function of this K naught plus delta K. Let me write it as a vector. times the two by two, most general two by two matrix, some combination of these poly matrices. Okay. Okay, and uh, this condition, it tells you that all of these Fs, we call it F mu, is just zero. Um, and now I want to expand as I move away, expand this function as I move away. Okay, and of course, what you can do is you can do a, um, you can do a Taylor expansion. Um, so there are various powers of uh, this delta k that will appear. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is um, Okay, so there's some velocity, the derivative of this energy with respect to k. And uh, in general, there's no reason to believe this would vanish. Okay, it's just some general function. There are no additional symmetries. Typically, the, if you have two things crossing, uh, they would have some finite value of this tangent. Okay, so this is just some velocity, let me call it v mu. Okay, so uh, if I'm close to this point, um, okay, I have um, some V naught times delta K times the identity plus some matrix V A dot delta K times the Pauli matrices. Okay, so I have sum on A. Okay, so that's the most gentle form. There's an overall velocity, which is sort of the, uh, how you tip this um, overall um, band crossing. Uh, and then there are these uh, other velocities associated with uh, these different uh, poly matrices. Okay, and there's one very symmetric uh, limit, um, you know, which is of course what the particle physics guys would have looked at. Uh, which is when you say that there is no um, overall velocity, um, 
this V0 is 0. Okay, so this is not necessarily true, but um, it's good to make contact with what we talked about before in terms of the wild fermions. So the, the different components of this velocity are just locked to the, the poly matrices. And then we can time sum, we say, just V. Okay, and this is just the while equation. Okay, and the sign of this velocity v uh, will tell you the chirality, whether it's plus or minus. Okay, so you recover uh, in the simple limit um, you know, the equation that we had over here. This is just the momentum, sigma dot p. Okay, so that's where the name comes from, that in three dimensions, if you just have non-degenerate bands, and you look at when they touch, uh, <clears throat> you can, there's a limit where they look exactly like the Weyl equation. In general, there is some more complexity over here. There's an overall velocity. These velocities can be different, anisotropic, and so on. Uh, but a lot of the physics, essential physics, uh, seems to carry over. Okay, and that's why it's useful. If you want to mine results that people have already uh, derived for Weyl fermions, uh, it, that's a useful starting point, And then you can see if it has a solid state or condensed matter analog. Okay, so at this point, this level of analysis, there are some, some things that are mysterious. Uh, the first thing is that uh, it's not very clear what topology has to do with this, right? So you had some argument about uh, accidental band touchings. What's topological about that, okay? Uh, the other thing is we'll see that um, if I look at all the different wild fermions uh, in my band structure, uh, the sum of their chiralities has to vanish. Okay, so there's a global constraint where the collection of chiralities in the Brillouin zone uh, has to sum up to zero. And that's something that's not obvious from this discussion over here. Why couldn't I have just a single band touching in my Brillouin zone? Right? It doesn't really tell you that uh, that's impossible. Um, that's, a, that's a separate argument that you need to make. You need to go beyond uh, this kind of characterization. Uh, the third thing, this uh, you know, may appear a little surprising. Uh, what it seems to say is that as long as I don't have one of these symmetries, uh, a band structure in three dimension will always have these wild points. Okay, or if you don't see one, you're kind of unlucky. Right. Um, they have three parameters. We just sort of tune three things to zero. You, know, uh, you have a good chance of getting these band touchings. Okay, so you may wonder why is it, you know, there's a big race on to find uh, wild fermions that people have already claimed to have seen some, but it took a few years, right? So you may wonder what, uh, what is missing. Uh, were we just being unlucky every single time, right? Uh, but there's actually another ingredient that we need to add when we talk about wild physics, which is that this wild node, uh, this band touching has to be near the Fermi energy. Okay, so it's somewhere deep down uh, in your band structure. Well, it's there, but um, the kind of physical consequences we're gonna be talking about are uh, not manifest uh, in such wild systems. Okay, so there's one additional requirement. Ideally, you'd like, to th like this to be exactly at your chemical potential. And this is what happens in graphene, right? Without any fine tuning, your Dirac nodes in graphene are right at your chemical potential. Okay, so we'd like a situation where we can tune one additional parameter, which is essentially this F0, and make it zero so that the wild nodes are exactly at the chemical potential. Okay, now you could of course imagine doing this by uh, you know, picking some very ideal band structure, but we'll see that there are situations where just naturally from stoichiometry that happens. And those are really the ideal kind of wild systems that you're looking for. Okay, and yeah, question. Can 
Yes, that's right. Right, right. So, well, so the question is also the same. So, are these coverage options the ones that you have to see? Yeah, so in that sense, it's similar to two dimensions, where in both cases, you get a gap. You can discuss what happened, what is that gap state like? Is it topological or not? But when you talk about stability, it's questions whether you open a gap or not. So, you're right that there's another way to think about these wild semi metals, which is if I focus on just a single while node, um, that's impossible in a three-dimensional band structure, as we'll see. They always come in opposite pairs. Uh, but it is possible on the surface of a four-dimensional system. Okay, and if you look at four dimensions in the same class, there is an integer classification. Okay, so that's another way in which you can characterize these while systems as the surface states of a four-dimensional system. Okay, so you know, many people might think that you never need to look at this table beyond the number three. Uh, that's what I used to think, actually. But uh, that's not quite true. It actually helps sometimes to look at these uh, other entries. Um, and uh, one thing this immediately tells you is that if you had disorder that scatters electrons but keeps you within a single node, okay, so it doesn't scatter you to the opposite while point, just keeps you within a node, that's like adding disorder on the surface of a four-dimensional topological phase. And we know that disorder does not localize a, a topological surface state. Okay, so in the same way, if I have disorder that's very short wavelength scattering keeps you within a single node, uh, you're protected against localization, even for a wild semi-metal. So there's actually some conceptual utility to think about it in terms of this surface state of a four-dimensional system. Okay, and of course, yeah. It has this symmetry of class A, which is basically no time reversal, but charge, co charge conservation, if you like. Um, it's an insulator, so it has charge conservation, uh, but no time reversal symmetry. Anywhere in energy space in your band structure. Can I understand your statement in the context of nearly the limit that we don't think it would be lucky or not in this case? Would you have to be like really in this case? So if you're in the tightly bound limit, you're right. You don't expect any band dispersion at all. Um, so then you do not have band dispersion and therefore no crossings. Um, so that's kind of the atomic limit. But if you're in the f nearly free limit and then you fold your Brillouin zones, uh, I think you will get these band crossings. Yeah, if you know otherwise, let me know. But I think you should get these band crossings. Of course, they're not guaranteed to be near the Fermi energy. Yeah. I didn't completely understand the answer to the first question. So if you think of it, if you take a while, point of the edge space that will be on uh, all, is it just the, the, is that an argument for Yes. Yeah, as, as the Dirac, for example, the Dirac nodes in, in 2D or, or the, the, the chiral edge modes in 1D. But if you focus on just one of them, so the analog is in a quantum wire, you have both a right and a left mover. Oh, okay. um, as long as you don't scatter between them. Yes, as long as you don't scatter between them. For a chiral edge mode, it's absolutely trivial because you know you cannot localize. But it's a little less trivial for, uh, for the wild system where, where you actually have velocities in different directions. You can get diffusion, but the diffusion cannot be suppressed into localization. OK, so, so yeah. In, in terms of getting the wild points out of the Fermi surface, are there any guiding principles for when this is likely to happen? Or is it just? So I'll give you an example where it happens, and you can see what, uh, what went into that. But that's a question we are very interested in. You know, can we just tell you the chemical formula? Symmetric group, and I can say, okay, it's got to have well notes at the at the Fermi. I think it should be possible to do that. That first term, it just tilts the bail, tilts the. Yes, it tilts it. Yeah. So there's one um, kind of observation that was made by um, uh, a, a group of people that um, if this velocity is large, is the largest velocity in the problem, the whole thing will tip over, uh, and it will look instead of looking like this. Okay, imagine you keep tipping it, uh, you, you, you get to a point where both of these velocities have the same sign. Okay, so I don't know if I can draw it, but it's something like this. 
Okay, so it has the same topology as a vial system, but um, this is called a type two vial semi-metal. Okay, so it has it'll have a different uh, fermiology in terms of the uh, fermi surfaces and so on. Um, and uh, you know, so there's some uh, recent interest in realizing systems that that do that. It, it's also also true for two dimensions. You can have dry cones that tip over. Yeah, that's that's uh, the extreme limit. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, um, so what I really wanted to talk about today was uh, the surface states associated with this wild semi metal, and for that you need to understand the topological property. You need to connect it uh, to its topological properties. Okay. So, um, um, so we did this argument where. Uh, we used accidental degeneracies. We saw it's connected to this while equation. Uh, but now let's talk about how the band invariants uh, enter in the characterization of these while nodes. Okay, and the answer is very simple. The way in which they appear is um, uh, if, I, if I encircle one of these while nodes with a surface, um, that surface will have a, a churn number. Okay, in this particular case, the churn number will be uh, exactly one. Okay, but uh, let me do that in a particular model. Um, there's some subtle distinction between the situation, the situation where you break time reversal and the, the situation where you break inversion. Okay, so in order not to say something that doesn't apply for both of them, let me consider the case that um, I break time reversal and let me just for convenience preserve inversion. Okay, and let me write down a band structure that uh, has a while node. Um, uh, so when you preserve inversion, uh, you can label the states in your system by their parity eigenvalues. Okay, so if I have an s orbital, for example, it has plus one, and a p orbital, it has minus one parity. Okay, so I can build a band structure. Let me say I have a site. I have two orbitals on a site. There's an s orbital and a p orbital. Okay, one of them has uh, in, uh, inversion eigenvalue plus one, and the other one has minus one. Okay, so it doesn't really have to be uh, microscopically like this. You can, from different pairs of sites, you can build up orbitals. But let me say it's like this to begin with. Okay. So, there's also K minus K, or is it just like a orbitals? orbitals, yeah. Yeah, just atomic orbital, let's say, with S and P. Yeah. Um, okay, so now if I look at a band structure, um, let me say I look at momentum K equal to zero. Okay, so because k equal to zero is invariant under inversion, I can label the states by their inversion eigenvalues. Um, and let's say I have a band which has inversion eigenvalue minus, let's say like that, and something that is plus. Let's call this kz. Okay, so this could be the p state, and this is the s, maybe in some semiconductor or something like that. Okay, and these are going to be non-degenerate because they broke time reversal symmetry. There's no spin degeneracy. Uh, these are non-degenerate states. Okay, so the simple question you can ask is, let's say I begin with an insulator, there's nothing at the Fermi energy, uh, and then I, uh, I take this pair of levels and make them cross. Okay, and that's what people uh, like, that's one way in which to think about topological insulators. You think of them as band inversion, where states with opposite inversion parity uh, get exchanged. Okay, but the big difference over there is you're talking about uh, states that are doubly degenerate, because they're Kramer's degeneracies. And in fact, the situation where that applies, even the bands are doubly degenerate. Okay, so if you repeat this exercise with doubly degenerate bands, do this band inversion, you get a topological insulator. Okay, but uh, let's do the simpler problem. Non-degenerate bands, opposite in, uh, uh, inversion eigenvalues, let's do the band crossing. Okay, so initially when we thought about this, uh, we were pretty, actually this was with Ari, we thought, oh, that's gonna give us some interesting topological phase. To some version of the topological insulator, but kind of confused because it only had inversion, no time reversal. But what you can show is that when this happens, there's no way that the system can be, gap can be gapped. It's always going to be gapless. Okay, and in fact, it realizes this wild semi-metal. Okay, so we'll show that in some toy model. Okay, so I want to do this. I want uh, my plus being up here and minus being up down there. So band inversion. Uh, 
No, when it goes through, and what happens in the case of topological insulators is these band crossing points, they get gapped out. In fact, that's one of the exercises to show that you will always get a gap, and you just get an insulating state, but it's got the inverted character, and that's the usual three-dimensional topological insulator. Okay, that's like the poor man's way of thinking of a three-dimensional topological insulator. But, but if they're... Yes, but if it's non-degenerate, what we'll show is it's basically going back to this counting argument. Um, it's easier to, to get a de force a degeneracy with non-degenerate bands, to force a pair of these bands to come together when you have uh, non-degenerate bands. There are fewer ways to split them. Um, and uh, it turns out that there's just no way in which this particular band structure can be completely gapped. It's always gapless. Okay, so there's a criterion. If you give me a material and tell me all of these parity eigenvalues for a non-degenerate bands, uh, we know in the past that you could predict if it's a topological insulator or not. Uh, in this particular case, you can predict if it's insulator or not. You know, there's a, a certain assignment of these parity eigenvalues where it can never be an insulator, like this one. If I tell you that all of the other bands, so there are actually eight points in the, in the Brillouin zone where you can assign these parity eigenvalues. If seven of them have the, the order plus and minus, and the eighth one I tell you is minus plus, then I can certify that this is not an insulator. Okay, and then what is it? The simplest uh, out, out of that is that it's a, a wild semi metal. Okay, so we'll, we'll see a, uh, a model that does that. Um, okay, and in fact, this was what we used when uh, you know, people had a band structure for a realistic material. We basically used some version of this to predict that it had to be a wild semi metal. Yeah. So since you're on this, the Charlie divided this top up from variance, but then said, Right. Yes. So I'll give you, a, maybe what's more useful is I'll give you a, a microscopic model that does this, and you'll see it has wild nodes. Uh, and then we can discuss the general proof. So it turns out that, um, you know, one of the simplest ways of proving this uh, is to use the entanglement spectrum. Uh, you know, you may think you don't need entanglement for a free fermion problem. But a big advantage of the entanglement spectrum is that, you know, when you want to characterize something, you want to talk in terms of surface states, something topologically, you want to talk in terms of surface states. Um, but the surface sometimes has less symmetry than the problem you started with, and that's a problem for regular surface states. Uh, for example, inversion, you know, we, we are kind of living off this inversion symmetry over here. Uh, inversion is broken at a surface. Inside and outside get exchanged by inversion. So the usual surface state, you know, you're trying to prove everything without this handle. But it turns out that entanglement spectrum can keep track of inversion. Actually, this was something that Ari and his collaborators figured out, and uh, we exploited that. Um, and then there's a very simple way to see that this thing is going to be metallic. There are other ways to see it, too. You can um, Somehow this was never, you know, this is something that should have been in Kittel's book. But uh, maybe it is known, but we never saw it written down anywhere that if I exchange, if I do a band inversion for non-degenerate bands, it's got to be metallic, metal or semi-metal. So you know, I've broken uh, time reversal, so I already have like um, a Zeeman field, if you like. So you can add spin orbit; it's not going to change anything. In fact, even without spin orbit, you can have spin textures that break this. Um, you know, that give you exactly the analog of spin orbit. Yeah, so you don't, uh, you don't have to invoke spin orbit. You're already, uh, spin orbit is usually important when you have, when you preserve the time reversal symmetry. So the case that we'll talk about later where you break inversion, preserve time reversal, there spin orbit is very important. Okay, so, um, uh, so let me write down a microscopic model that basically captures this idea. It's not the most gen generic one. Uh, it's in the spirit of writing down something that has the physics uh, and is easy to analyze. Okay, now it looks like I have less erasing to do over here, so let me do it. Okay, so, so we want something that will um, do this band inversion. Uh, so we said that this uh, matrix tau z, uh, actually I didn't say that, but let me say this matrix tau z, uh, when acting on these states, um, uh, tells me the inversion eigenvalues. Okay, so. Okay, 
Okay, so if I apply the inversion transformation uh, on my Hamiltonian, okay, so then I apply this tau z on my matrix H, and then I take H to minus H. Okay, and this symmetry at the level of block Hamiltonians, we label things by k, is only relevant when k is equal to minus k. For example, at k equal to zero, when you just conjugated by the tau z's. That should give you h when, if it's inversion symmetric, yeah, at k equal to zero. But in general, this is, um, yeah, this is the inversion transformation. Okay, so, um, so let me write down a Hamiltonian, which basically does this for you. Um, so you want something with a quadratic dispersion. Um, so we know the, the, the lattice way of writing that is uh, just in terms of these cosines. Okay, so if I do a Taylor expansion near k equal to zero, I get k squared, um, uh, and there's an overall factor of three um, so I'm going to write down some overall constant uh, that will uh, end up giving me the sign change. Okay, we'll, we'll see in a minute what that constant gamma should be. There is some hopping, we call it T, uh, and this is proportional to tau z. Okay, so if you expand this, it looks like a parabola with some um, you know, constant offset, um, and I can tune this constant uh, to take the para parabolas to be uh, separated to make them cross. Okay, so we'll see that uh, we're gonna get something interesting in the limit where this gamma is between one and minus one. Okay, we'll get a while semi-metal. Okay, now I want also a dispersion along, uh, which involves hopping between the different uh, orbitals S and P, so tau x and tau y. Uh, and you can show that the, they can only come with uh, something that's odd in the momentum, like sine kx and sine ky. So this is just some arbitrary choice uh, to make it look more like our um, ideal wild system. Okay, so now if you think of doing inversion, uh, inversion commutes with tau z and the momenta do not uh, the cosine of the momenta are uh, invariant. The signs change sign, but these taus also change sign. Okay, so this is a Hamilton it's, that's invariant under inversion, but it breaks time reversal symmetry because these are all non-degenerate bands. Okay, so if you analyze what happens uh, uh, when this gamma is unity, uh, that's when these two levels exactly meet uh, at k equal to zero. So that's just the transition point where they meet. Um, for gamma very large, they're well separated. Gamma equal, to z, uh, gamma equal to one, they meet. And then as you drop below one, they cross. Okay, so if you just look at, um, sorry, these are. So gamma much larger than one, it looks like this. Um, so gamma equal to one. Along kz, the dispersion looks like this, and gamma slightly less than one um, looks like this, just this kz part. Yeah, it's the fact, it, that's important actually. So. For example, if these were both uh, the same, you know, if they had the same uh, inversion eigenvalue, uh, you wouldn't be able to make them meet. You wouldn't be able to take them through each other. That's right, yeah, so these would bounce off each other. This is the problem where you need three things to, to make them touch. But somehow at the level of the, what about the level of the Hamiltonian? Yeah, good, so at the level of this Hamiltonian, uh, it appears that at k equal to zero, I can, tune this touching uh, with just one parameter. 
Okay, so why is that? Because these off-diagonal matrix elements are zero. And they have to be zero from symmetry. Um, so the original argument I made was without any symmetries. Here we have a symmetry that assigns a Z2 quantum number, plus or minus, um, and, and they're different. So the off-diagonal matrix elements have to vanish. But, you know, that's right, that's right. That's the bouncing off of these guys. Uh, but here, at least if you're at the point k equal to zero, these are ineffective. And they only appear when you move away because you basically lose inversion defined at that particular k point. Well, if you do not have spin orbit. Yeah, no spin orbit. Yes. Then every, yeah. Yeah, so then it just comes to the right. All my levels, you can call them spin up, and there's exactly the same thing happening with spin down. But as soon as you have spin orbit, in, uh, spin orbit interactions, which you do, for example, in these topological insulator systems, you can gap this out completely. Okay, that's the exercise two in the notes, uh, just to do the count with, with spin orbit. Oh, I'm out of time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so maybe I'll stop here. <laughs>